Okay, today we fight with one another, and we not only wanted to fight with one another, but we wanted to bring in dear friends to referee, and maybe <laughs> even we can watch them fight today. So welcome today, and that's our agenda is fighting, and we brought friends along with us for that, right? We did. That we did. We are Dr. David and Teresa Mabry from One Another Marriage. Welcome to um, this particular a format and style where we are going to be talking with some dear friends of ours about our topic this month, which is conflict. And um, if you're joining us for the first time on YouTube mm -hmm. channel, welcome. Please remember to hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe, um, and uh, hit the bell for notifications, and you'll be notified when we drop a new video. We're joined today by our dear friends, Laverne and Rhonda Nisley, who they have worked in uh, ministry and marriage and family work specifically for the last several years and multiple years, investing in other people, uh, becoming uh, marriage and family relationship experts, and not only uh, becoming that and knowing that, but just making a difference in people's lives all these years. They are uh, good friends and heroes of ours, and we really wanted to bring them in on the conversation yeah. for our uh, yeah. theme for this month on conflict, on how you do it, because we, we've said it over and over again, conflict mm -hmm. is inevitable. We're gonna get their mm -hmm. perspective on it, and but how do you deal with the inevitable conflict that arrives? So Laverne and Rhonda, welcome. Hi, we're so glad to be with you. You guys are heroes of ours also, and we love watching what you guys are doing, and you're doing a great job. Keep keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Well, we we wanted to start off with a softball conversation piece, <laughs> and that is, what has been the silliest thing that the two of you have thought <laughs> over? Well, you know, COVID and working from home has definitely brought its own set of challenges, and you know, particularly in the kitchen, I mean, because there is a right way to do things. <laughs> I know the right way to do them. Um, there's a right way to load the dishwasher. There's a right way to cut up veggies. There's a right way to clean up after yourself and the right way to yeah, use the sinks and all of that. And it, he doesn't know them. <laughs> and it's amazing how we've never had these kinds of arguments before. I mean, we've We've been married almost 42 years. We've worked together for 15 years. And, you know, we've had those arguments, but we were kind of surprised at how suddenly things changing and being isolated just maybe took the stress level up. And probably the deeper issue there is just control, both of us fighting for control. But, yeah, we just thought kitchen is its just a funny place to yeah. have, have conflicts. <laughs> You know, that people would say, they think, okay, well, the two of you, 42 years of marriage, right. and you, you, and you teach other people, it's like, certainly you would never have any more conflict in your relationship. You think, yeah. But, <laughs> but why, why is that? Why is that? I think that's a good, great question for all four of us to kind of, what are your thoughts on why do couples still have uh, conflict? W wouldn't you think they'd master this, right? I think you're right. That That is a puzzle. And I think it's been freeing for us to just let go of that expectation. Yeah, we we, we get called experts and we <laughs> like to say we're experts at failure. We, we know how to fail really good. But I think there's a freedom in, okay, we can learn from our failures. We can, we can be humble. And that seems to serve us well as we're interacting with couples who aren't looking for experts and these people up on pedestals. They're looking for people just like them mm -hmm. and who also are still human. We're still human and so we're still going to make mistakes. Yeah, I, I think early on we, we used a more logical, cerebral approach where, you know, here's, you kind of list out uh, the issues and you discuss civilly and you arrive at a solution and um, you know as as the years have gone on we we found yeah. that some of those approaches just totally leave out the emotion um, yeah. Yeah. which I don't know about you guys but if I'm upset you know the whipping out of a card and say here we need to do this <laughs> She told me once, helpful. you know where you can put that card. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yep. That's right. 
So well, I'm very interested in your silliest. I mean, you guys have, do you still have conflicts or, I mean, this, this uh, is a question I was dying to ask <laughs> you guys. Wait, wait a second. Do we have conflicts? <laughs> yes. I, whatever she says is true. That's yes. okay. Cool. Yes, it's silliest. There, there have been multiple. There have been multiple, but um, I mean, one of our silliest was a, an empty milk jug on top of a trash can. <laughs> Was, I mean, like, what? That was, you who know? does that, right? <laughs> I mean, like, it made perfect sense to me. It, yeah, That's but, where the jug goes. But, but two, your point, Rhonda, like with um, with COVID and with finding yourselves at home um, or early on, like staying there, just, you know, like, um, I too, you know, mm -hmm. there's a proper way to to do things in the kitchen and air area. And it's like, yeah, why, why are we fighting about something? So like, so it's just the two of us, you know? So yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it shouldn't be that bad. It shouldn't be that bad, right. Uh, it, so it feels like uh, the silly ones come out the most when, when like you're hangry yeah. or you're like, when you're, when you personally are, are like, like off a little kilter and it's kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah. they're the easiest target mm -hmm. right here, right? Yeah. It's a, the easiest target is the person closest to you. It's like, you know, they're going to deal with this anyhow. I'm hungry, <laughs> I'm tired, and I don't, I don't care that the milk jug is supposed to go in the yeah. trash instead of on top. So, so that's usually when it comes out, right? The silliness, it, it gets higher the more irrational we feel on the inside. Yeah. And it's usually probably not about the milk jug or the dishes. It's those are like up here on the surface somewhere. And it's just those deeper kind of unmet off kilter, like you say, mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I, I, I think that's helpful for couples to know and to understand. But I think the other thing is to normalize conflict. We're going to have conflicts. We're, we're human beings. We come from completely different family trees, different personalities. And so let's just normalize. Let's embrace the train wrecks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's not try to cause them, but when they happen, and they, they can very quickly take place. We watched, um, we watched, I have to put this one, we just rewatched the story of us, the movie, uh, the other night. Yeah. Because we hadn't seen it in so long. Yeah, the last time we saw it would have been like 2006. Yeah. So, like, oh. we, we just hadn't rewatched it in a while. And yeah. so for those out there that are watching, this is the story of us as a movie that we use clips from that with Bruce Willis and Michelle Pfeiffer. We mm -hmm. use clips for training when the four of us work together. Uh, and and I don't know, do you still use some of those clips with training? Yeah, or? we do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, in watching in watching that, one of our favorite scenes is a scene that we all used for the training, which is when you two go to bed. There are six of you in the bed, and so um, your your parents and your parents, and so and we just did a video on Fui, uh, family of origin impacts everything, um, and so so my I guess that's a, to throw it out to the two of you. How have you seen? To what extent have family of origin? You mentioned it, Laverne, already, uh, but to what extent and how do family how do couples deal with the impact of family of origin and um, as kind of a one of those elements of, of producing conflict in the relationship. Yeah, I, I think expectations have their roots in our families of origin. And so expectations and differing expectations is, that's like, that's like the oxygen of conflict because that just, you know, when that, when that fire is burning, it's like those expectations just come flooding back. And like for Rhonda, for, the size family that she grew up in, a large family, me growing up in a smaller family, and just things were administrated differently. There well, were just, different expectations. And yeah, I mean, very different how conflict was handled. Um, in my family, I have eight siblings, so there's nine of us. I mean, it was kind of out there, but then we got over it and we went on and, you know, mm -hmm. as close as can be. Mm -hmm. yep. In my family, it was just conflict was handled differently. I mean, there were times that there were good outcomes, I suppose, but it was just very different. And so even how we fought, my, probably my mode of operations when it comes to conflict was always to try to minimize it and just let's get everything back to harmony. And, and for her, she didn't care about harmony. She was like, 
let's 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 get this, you know. <laughs> let's get it out there on the let's table. Just get the emotions out. And I was like, yeah. my goodness, you're being so unreasonable. And she would be like, you know, you are so clueless. And and it was just this cycle that we would get into. But I think kind of going back to our family of origins, that really had a big influence for us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rhonda. I was going to say, I think that's one of the biggest things we had to learn in dealing with our conflict is that it's okay to have those emotions, but how do you deal with those? And then some of those other conflict resolution tools can be a lot more productive. So I think the timeout was one just to, and, and I mean, he's, he's so even keel. You know, I rarely do I even see him angry. And if I do, I want to laugh because it's not <laughs> so out of character for him. And, <laughs> but, but so it's usually me that needs the cooling off period. Um, and then I think the other one is the emotional jug where just, um, you know, to have permission to kind of walk through those layers of, of anger and, and um, some sadness and, uh, fear. fear and and because sometimes those things are underneath and to really be able to express mm -hmm. them I know it's helpful for me and for us to move to a place where we can resolve conflict right yeah and, and in we're um Ron I'm glad you mentioned those two tools and then mm -hmm. we can go to your question is it uh first one is a timeout just so everyone who's watching um, can you uh, unpack just basically what a timeout is for couples that may not be familiar with that? And, and then just, you said a little bit about the emotional drug. We agree totally. Those two tools are powerful, but maybe just a little bit more on emotional drug for folks to understand more clearly what those are. Yeah, both of, both of these are attempting to deal productively with the emotions and especially the volatile emotion of anger. I mean, that's, that's one that's really out there. But the timeout is basically just saying, look, we need a little bit of time to just step away from this conflict. Let's give ourselves 30 minutes, an hour, maybe even if it's late at night, let's get a good night of sleep and, and approach this again some other time. Very much like a timeout in the NFL. I mean, one team calls it for themselves. They just say, we need a timeout to kind of cool, cool down, get our thoughts together, but then we'll come back. You don't just walk off the field. That we, we've seen some couples think that, well, we're doing a timeout by just walking away. Right. And it's really not. There has to be a, a time to come back. The emotional jug or uh, letting off steam is a way of one person saying to the other, would you like to express some of the emotions that you're feeling? So I might just say, Rhonda, what, is, what are you angry about? And Rhonda would say, here's what I'm angry about. What else are you angry about? And then what are you sad about? What are you scared about? And then what are you glad about? And it really is amazing how that, that validates those emotions. Those emotions are not bad, they're just there, but it's a safe way for another person to get those emotions out. So, and, and you guys have said that you've, you've maybe taught these two tools or you've used these two tools as well. What have you seen in terms of effectiveness? How, how do they work with couples? What do you think? Yeah, they're very, I mean, when we've sat across from couples coaching them and then you introduce this, um, once again, it goes back to, you know, you're actually presenting that kind of like gift to your partner by saying, you know, like, um, you know what, I just need a time out right now because possibly they're recognizing in themselves that they're, they're going to go too far, you know, and then they're, it's right. going to cause more damage. Right. And so by having some of that control to just say, I need a time out and I need mm -hmm. to be able to like decompress here for a little bit. And in reality, um, working with couples, trying to get the other spouse or other partner to just recognize that that actually um, you, you shouldn't be offended at that. Don't be offended that the one person is requesting a timeout, right? right? And so it's so easy though to to want to be offended on that, but it's it's really trying to take care of the relationship. You're trying not to do more damage. So and then reminding and encouraging couples that yeah, you can't can't stay on a timeout. Like you got you got to come back. You need yeah. to circle back around. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to still address it, but cooler heads will prevail. 
um, in the end, which the time out has been very helpful for a lot of our couples because they realize mm -hmm. it, it helps, it helps flip you back into that thinking part, you know, of your brain. So and we peaked. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, real quick, is one thing that we teach as well is, and you you two have alluded to it already, that but we teach about there are two rooms in your brain, and you set up your chairs in one room, or you set up your chairs in the other room, and the one room is an emotional brain, a uh, part of your brain, the emotional room, and sometimes that emotional room is not a bad place to be given the circumstance mm -hmm. of the place. We're, we're not non-emotional beings, and we shouldn't be expected to be non-emotional completely. But when you're trying to resolve conflict, setting up your chairs in the emotional brain usually is looks like this. And so it's picking up your chairs and intentionally moving your chairs into another room, which is your thinking brain. And that that room is where it and oftentimes it takes that time out in order to move your chairs from one room to the other. Yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, that's good to, to actually move away from, from the emotional brain. I one of our observations is that many couples, one of them um, has, has tried, to do, tried to do the timeout. Maybe they've just kind of walked out. The other one is the pursuer. They want to keep things going. And, and so you sometimes see this mismatch of who's in favor of the timeout and who isn't. Yeah. And I think it's helpful for, for those of us who may be helping that third party to help them set the ground rules. That, that really has been helpful to see them at least try it. Let's, let's set the ground rules. Here's how this is gonna work. Don't just walk out, but then take the time out and, and see what happens. Yeah. Right, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, well, in light of like the years of, of experience you've had with um, other couples, what would you say you feel like is is the number one or top two reasons that keep coming up of of why couples continue to have conflict or fight? We were talking about this, and I I think we said a core reason is just the differing expectations, but a lot of those expectations are around responsibilities. Who's going to do what? It could be chores. It could be could be anything. Who's going to pick up the kids? I, I think that's been an area, a huge area of, of our own conflict. Mm -hmm. I think even you get into finances. You know that's a major issue for. But even that doesn't seem to be the core. It's you drill down deeper. It's how they're communicating about decisions. Yeah, I mean those different expectations. Of course, personalities play into it. Um, one may be more organized and structured and the other one more laid back. So, I, you know, it's those differences in who we are and differences in what we expect. Mm -hmm. I think typically somewhere is at the core. And I think that for, for couples in working with couples, for them to understand some of those things before jumping into you know, your, your biggest, hairiest conflict is really helpful. And sometimes we've, we've actually needed to tell couples, look, we'll, we'll get to your conflicts. But first of all, there are, this is like building blocks here. We need for you to understand who you are and, and what makes you tick. Uh, let's get you communicating. Let's get you making some good deposits into the relationship. Now we think we're ready to look at some conflicts, but, but they've, done the work, they've done the foundation building. What are your, how do you see that uh, in terms of a progression? Yeah, um, we actually, we had almost a, a very similar discussion to what you guys just had there because yeah. like I was talking about, I think for a lot of the couples um, that we've seen over the years now, mm -hmm. um, where we hear like, okay, uh, finances is, can be, you know, a top, kind of mm -hmm. category that couples may have disagreement over, right? Um, but but a lot of that for me, like I brought up, you know, the personality where I feel like we have we have people um, who they've been together for a while, but they still forget that they are these, you know, they each came in with these own their own personality of, you know, and family of origin and all that stuff. And so sometimes helping them rewind, like you were just saying, Laverne, mm -hmm. to say, 
well, you know, this is what we want to try and figure out about you and what we want you to, you know, be reminded of with yourselves, as well as um, if you've been married at any length of time, you're not the exact same person that you were, you know, sure. like way back when. So, you know, how have you, yeah. you're right. Yeah. And so how have you changed or, or adapted or things mm -hmm. like that? Um, and, and so I, that was my personal perception that I was, I was seeing with a lot of couples was the light bulbs were kind of going on with like, Oh, well, yeah. Like, you know, they kind mm -hmm. of, they always respond this way or I always respond this way or whatever. And like, um, for them to understand who they actually were and then how do we merge the best of those qualities. Right. And then mm -hmm. David alluded to exactly what you had just shared Laverne about basically after I was unpacking that and we were talking about it, he said, but doesn't it just kind of boil down to it's um, unmet expectations, which is what you were just saying. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I said, yeah, it pretty much is like that the is, reality of most conflict. Yep. That's interesting that, uh, that you, 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 gave the the exact, <laughs> you two came to the same conclusions. You're so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. No, it's, so it's seriously the and we no, did not discuss this prior to that. Right. So. We didn't just so everyone knows out there, we did not uh, exchange notes. But right. we but because the four of us have worked with couples for so long, it really that is interesting because the Teresa asked a great question and is, you know, we see the research or or people have said over and over again, you know, finances is the number one cause of split up or whatever. And I don't know if I agree with that. I, I think mm -hmm. that uh, I think as far as that being primary, because there's a root issue right. behind yeah. the finances. Right. Like any couple can deal with whatever financial situation they're going through if they are walking mm -hmm. through those relational, um, the, the having relational equity with one another, um, uh, build, building up those the love banks, um, mm -hmm. being able to have um, and to have fair expectations of the other, not undue expectations or, or unrealistic expectations. Right. Like, okay, you know what? I, I take you for who you are. You take me for who I am, what I bring to the table, what you bring to the table. And the couples that we have worked with that have been the most challenged, it's because they're, it seems that it's because they're placing, it's like, she's not doing this for me. Yes. Or he's not fulfilling this expectation for me. And some of it's legitimate, right? Some of it's like, okay, he needs to stop being a bozo because his foolish behavior is causing challenges or her foolish behavior. But a lot of times it's like, I'm just tired of this. They're, they're, they're on my nerves now. They're not living how I want them to live. <laughs> so, and it's like, yeah. yeah. What's it mean to learn, learn to live with that person? In, in mm -hmm. You know, I, we, we came across something recently. I'd, I'd really be interested in your take on this. It's, it's called the 70% principle where, you know, if, if expectations are high and you miss them, it's that gap that leads to disappointment. Yeah. yeah. But if you bring the expectations down and you're actually doing better than you thought, it, and, and so it's kind of like, you know, the reality in most couples probably is, you know, five out of seven days are pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of days where there may be, it may get a little bit prickly. And so to, to think about what if we just accepted 70% mm -hmm. and, and adjusted our expectations, realizing that we are human. Now, what that's going to mean is I'm going to need to let you be you and you let me be me. Now that, that only is true for preferences. It's not true for morality <laughs> kinds of things. Like I'm gonna be faithful to you five days a week and then I've got two days to kind of run around. 70% of the time, I'm faithful to you. <laughs> what, 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 do, what do you think of that? Is that, is that copping out? Is it, uh, comes from Patrick Morley. Yeah. Who, yeah. Uh, who's written on uh, relationships. Yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. I'm curious if we can make a connection with uh, Dr. John Gottman's work with where he, his claim is that for healthy, vibrant couples, 70%, about 65 to 75% of their conflict goes unresolved. Mm -hmm. And that, that it's couples that are healthy and vibrant 
learn to discern what is a minor issue and what is a major uh, issue. Mm -hmm. and yeah. that, that, that 30 to 35% of what is solved or dealt with it are major issues or issues that really should be right. dealt with. And then, but the, but that large vast majority uh, healthy, vibrant couple, couples are able to look at it and go, you know what, I, I'll, I'll bring it up. It's like, for instance, what we, the four of us teach couples, and that is um, healthy assertiveness. So do an I wish, I want exercise of some kind and how, how that would feel if it were to be accomplished. And so, or a, uh, a concern with recommendation, complaint with request for change, or um, an area that uh, what would bring us peace today is, is a term we use. And, and for um, the rings chat, you guys use what for that? Mm -hmm. A need that yeah, the need. That yep. What do you need from me? What what I need from you? Yeah. yeah. So to be able to end a daily conversation, to be able to communicate clearly needs, but then to be able to overlook things that that are like, okay, I brought it up and it wasn't dealt with. So I'm curious if there's a there's a correlation, a, a, correlation, a connection with Morley's uh, mm -hmm. assertion, and then what we can put with Gottman's uh, research. Mm -hmm. There, there possibly is. I mean, I, I haven't. Seems uh, flipped. It, it does seem flipped. I, I would yeah. think that it'd be the other way. I haven't seen documents where, where it's you're saying it's seventy percent is unresolved. Is is that what you said? Seventy. Yeah. Wow, that seems high. I would think you could live with maybe thirty percent unresolved and seventy percent probably want to be pretty much on the same wavelength. But but I don't know. I haven't seen that research. His yeah. whole his whole contention is that it's um there you're able to yeah, overlook minor offenses. And he, yeah. yeah. And then have that discernment. And know which ones are minor and which ones are major. Yeah. Right. But then again, Gottman does say that active listening is not effective. So <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yeah. we need to consider, take everything uh, in yeah. stride yeah. and kind of consider. Yeah. So. Yeah. He has a lot of, he has a lot of stuff that's really very helpful. And so, yeah, uh, we we love the math that he's done. I mean, he's a mathematician, and he's very he's been very observant, and he's been able to put together cause and effect relationships, which I think is good for couples to to look. What happens? What's going to happen if I uh, invalidate my wife, for example? What and and what's going to happen if she yells at me? What are the odds that we're going to have a productive conversation? I mean, just look at the math of that, and it, and it really should be self-evident, but we, we keep kind of going through through cycles that we've repeated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but that whole concept, though, of just um, of, of giving grace, right? Like you said, like, I mean, we, you can't expect 365 great days, mm -hmm. you know, like you're, you're going to have to give some grace that there's going to be some moments and times where... Um, you're not going to be at your best and, and that that's okay. Um, and that allowing couples to not have that expectation, right. Mm -hmm. To say, it's okay. If, if you, if you are just hitting that like 70%, you know, this is, this is okay. You yeah. know, like it's, um, you're, st you're not, um, you're not failing at your marriage or your relationship just because you might only be 70% to 80%. Mm -hmm. That's, that's still really, really good because mm -hmm. we still have to take into account all the, the rest of what it means to be a person and what <laughs> with emotion and <laughs> uh, stress and, yeah. you know, just, you yeah. know, like, yeah, just uh, to live with somebody. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a lot going on there, yeah. even though it's been, I mean, I've, I've lived longer now with David than I did with my family of origin, mm -hmm. you know, but like, um, it's still, you still are, you still make choices every day about, I choose to either, you know, let this irritate, bother me to the point of contention, or I choose to just go, eh, yeah, it's okay. That, and, I can go. And also to that is that the choice to do better as, as a partner like, okay, I know that, for instance, I know that for Teresa, because I'm working out of the house, she's out of the house earlier in the day. I know that when she comes home from being gone, it, it really gets on her last nerve 
if there are crumbs on the counter <laughs> from from really? the, the morning toast. I know that. And so I make a conscious effort at yep. saying, I want to make sure that the, and I don't like a, a messy place anyhow, but if I, if I know it's important to her, so yep. I'll make an extra effort at like, okay, I, I want to make sure the counters are clear because it's, I know when she walks in the door, That's it's the first less, thing I see. It's the first thing she sees, <laughs> but it's, and it's not like Teresa is like a really picky person or a, I don't, I don't see her mm -hmm. as someone who's just, eggshells right yeah and we know some of those personalities it's more because i i know that's important to her yeah and and i know that if i don't do it it's going to cause her stress level to go up and so it's not going to be about the crumbs but it's going to be something else that's going to end up being or we're both going to be in our emotional room mm -hmm. but do you see that same thing as like what does what does making effort as an individual in the relationship play how does that play into uh, not just overlooking but trying to be better for your spouse yeah, and I, I think this goes back to materials that I'm sure you guys have, uh, maybe you're still using them, but the five love languages, just being literate about that. What is it that really speaks to your partner? And it's often just the little things that really can mean a lot. For example, Rhonda communicated to me once, I, I think it was kind of back in that phase we were making some adjustments in the kitchen. She, she started seeing me leaving eggshells in the strainer in the in the sink and that just it just really you know ticks her off and that's just you know and a little bit like crumbs on the counter i suppose you know as i think about that now why wouldn't i go ahead and just deal with that why would i i love this woman and so to be able to do something like that to clean up after myself I tend to be the, the person in our family that would leave stuff out, Dave. I mean, I, I would, I could see leaving a milk jug out on the, on the, on the trash container. Yeah. You know, does it really have to go in there? I'll get to it later. But because of my love, and I, I think that's the core, that can be the motivation that drives us to just push through and do those things. So go ahead and grade me now. Uh, if, if you would. <laughs> How you're, am I doing? You're, am I you're doing? doing really well. But, you know, when we were first talking about that whole 70%, you know, I said, that's not something we should apply for ourselves. Like, okay, if I get it 70%, I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, I want to strive to do yeah. better than that. But yeah. in terms of being th that 30%, that I think it goes beyond that at times, but just that's the grace part where, you know, no one's perfect and there's mm -hmm. going to be that gap in mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for ourselves to excuse our behavior by ah, 70% of the time, I, I probably not took helpful. care of the crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. What, uh, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about real, you mentioned a couple tools to mm -hmm. kind of give space. But, uh, but let's talk about for a minute, and I'm, I'm really eager to find out this question because I know the two of you have really explored uh, practical solutions for couples on conflict resolution. What, what would you say is your number one or number two, two, two good, great tools or one, what your best, what's your go-to best practical tool to help resolve conflict in a healthy way within a relationship? So they've taken their time out or whatever. What, what tool would you like, if you sat down and had one session, what do you like, this is what we want to teach them for them to walk away. Let's be really practical too. If, if yeah, you know. yeah. So th this is the tool that came to us via a, uh, an elementary school principal. And this principal was actually, you know, as, as he would bring kids who had been fighting out on the playground and trying to get them to resolve their conflicts, and it was simply called the SOS. Mm -hmm. And it's story, options, solution. And so the idea is, and we've, we've taken that and tweaked it a little bit, and it's probably our go-to tool. We, we may do it you know, three, four times a year. Most of the other times we can, if it's not as, as intense, we can, we can just, hey, I just wish this. It would make me feel better if you did this. I mean, to, to work it through like that. But the SOS is based upon two very important things in conflict resolution. One is understanding, mm -hmm. to understand the other person, and it helps to understand the issue. But then the other 
thing is to actually solve the issue. If we don't get both of those going, then it's still going to keep coming up. And so the understanding is based upon each getting a chance to share their story uninterrupted, to, to say, this is what bothers me, this is what's bugging me, and here's how I feel, here's kind of what I think the deeper issue might be. I take responsibility for how I'm contributing. I really want you to understand this about it. I can see how, how you're coming out at this. And then they switch places, but, but it's really a very almost tedious process to go back and forth and make sure that we're understanding each other, but then to move on to solutions or, or to options and then ultimately picking your best, best solution. Yeah, and I know you had referred to active listening and, um, you know, along with that, the speaker listener technique and um, really some good stuff there. But I, I think the feedback we got and we experienced too is it doesn't necessarily move you to resolution. Mm -hmm. And so I, for, for us to tag on that option and solution, you're moving couples to, and typically, you know, we, we encourage them to start with something small. You know, crumbs on the table, something very specific, and you kind of walk them through that. And if they can solve that, and you know, that's one less irritant, it gives them the confidence then to work on bigger issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of these tools are very similar in nature, but as we said, most of them are going to deal with understanding, but then also the solution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, um, that has been, that's also been one of our kind of uh, go-to um, tools as well is just um, not only for personal um, reflection, mm -hmm. we find ourselves a lot of times, like you can tell, you know, we have a disagreement over something and then it's presenting our side. Um, giving the options, which option do you like best, and then getting into that negotiation a little bit um, with that. But, mm -hmm. but helping couples to be able to process the understanding part and the solve part, and that you need both. And once you understand, you can move to the solve so much faster. And that's the, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the SOS, is it helps, that story helps to provide, mm -hmm. you know, that understanding. Um, mm -hmm. And, and to help it become muscle memory, right? right. The healthiest couples that we, the four of us all see are those, and those move towards health and, and vibrancy are those that um, it's more, it becomes intuitive, mm -hmm. not perfect, but it becomes more intuitive for them to, to, to just have simple phrases of, of um, you know, this is, you know, it, for us, muscle memory of using phrases like complaint with request for change, or mm -hmm. as Teresa alluded, the options I've considered are, and mm -hmm. in going through those, the one I like the best is, and that feels very awkward and clunky for if it's not something that a couple is used to, mm -hmm. but our encouragement, I think all four of us would encourage any couple that's listening today to push through the awkwardness and the mm -hmm. clunkiness of what we would call a skill or a tool and, 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 and just practice it on a regular basis and it will become part of muscle memory right. so that you can experience um, that resolution. The second thing that goes with that for, for me is, and for us, and we, we teach it, and I know the two of you teach this on a regular basis, is the idea that um, we, we specifically would talk about having leverage in your relationship, that when the two of you are walking through what we would, we would coin that one another relationship where you're seeking a mutually beneficial reciprocal relationship, it gives you leverage so that you can lift a heavier load and life is a heavy load. Your relationship is a, can be a heavy load. So when the two of you are working in concert with one another with that muscle memory kicking in because you've practiced, it really gives you leverage with those, kind of those major issues that are gonna happen, those stresses, uh, stressors, the conflict that's going to happen in in your relationship and from outside coming into the relationship. And so, do you see that? And in what ways have you seen that leverage that couples experience? Finally, they have leverage in life, or relationship, and with conflict because they've learned those tools. Absolutely, I, I I think most couples do not have a go-to tool 
they don't have a go-to method. It's either the survival of the fittest or they just avoid it altogether. You know, it's exactly. And so those two extremes, but, but to have something that, you know, 90% of the time it's going to lead to a solution they can both support and, and to have that kind of leverage. Yeah. We, we see couples growing in confidence and, you know, a question we're always curious about, how is this different from the way that you're used to doing it? There's no, there's no different. There, there's no change. I mean, there's no comparison in terms of how different this is to how, I mean, usually we would be angry with each other, but this calmed us down. I feel heard. I feel understood. And it's just a totally different way of, of handling it. I know that before we had tools, I mean, there were some, some issues that there's one issue that we were in conflict about for 29 years. And it would, it would always have to do with when um, we're getting ready to, to go out of town or, or my parents were coming or, or something like that, a little bit different schedule. We could handle the routine stuff, but, but the expectations were never really clarified or worked through to completion. We did this, we struggled. We went in circles for 29 years. Mm-hmm. We solved it in 15 minutes with a tool like this. Yeah. And so while not all, Conflicts are going to be solved in 15 minutes. Some are going to need sometimes a third party just to be there and help maybe give some, some other insights. But, but to have a tool is, so, I mean, it's the different, like if you, if you don't have a screwdriver and you need a screwdriver, how, how uh, frustrating it is to, you know, to try to do it some other way. And so yeah. tools are so important. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Having that right tool in the tool belt for whatever mm-hmm. it is that you need, mm-hmm. but to see the, um, to see the just almost like um, joy with a couple when they actually attest to using a skill or a tool and then actually were able to solve it and then found that, you know what, that wasn't so bad, you know, it was like, okay. And then like, there's this like, there becomes this ownership of it for them that, oh my gosh, we finally, we have something now. We have something to go to um, and to use. Because like we said, we, we almost want to say uh, conflict is normal. You're, yeah. you're not in crisis just because you have conflict, yeah. right? Yeah. So conflict mm-hmm. is normal. It is inevitable. I mean, conflict is a mere disagreement. That's mm-hmm. what it is. And then like, Everything mm-hmm. else about us is what feeds and fuels, you know, into that. Mm-hmm. But how exciting is it when when a couple gets a hold of a tool or a skill that they really resonate with, and and yeah. it just it's it's just a change, you know. It's fun. And it's and fun. and it almost then it almost helps them to understand, like, okay, like the next time we do face this, because we will we now have something, we have something to fall back on and use. We actually, I've been, uh, <clears throat> we've been coaching and training another couple who's become a coach, mm-hmm. uh, marriage coaches, and they put, and they came to us uh, <laughs> within the last month and they were all excited and they were like, hey, hey, we had a conflict, we had a conflict that we were able to use this tool with. And so <laughs> they were excited that they got into a fight because yeah. they, they, they could use the tool uh, <laughs> to, to work through it. So it, that's, that's a win right there and exciting to be like, hey, we get the, I, it's rare that we ever have people come to us and they're, they're glad they fought. We had a fight, yay. <laughs> we had a fight and we got to use the tool. They were so excited. So, but when you become, we, we say that when you become a marriage nerd, um, and like the four of us are marriage mm-hmm. nerds, um, and they officially stepped over that line of becoming marriage <laughs> nerds. And so yeah. we're proud, proud of them. So, they embrace conflicts now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, hey, before we uh, close up shop, how can people be able to connect? How can they get, become connected with the two of you? Can you tell us this? Yeah, what are your handles? How do you? How do people connect? Sure. So you guys are pretty regional in your your scope, but mm-hmm. but you do um, people can still kind of find benefit you. from your services and find absolutely you. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much just for inviting us into this uh, space. And it's so good to just be you know, iron sharpening iron. Hopefully we're, we're iron sharpening iron here, but I, I um, yeah, thank you so much. And the, probably the best way to get in touch with us is to go to our website and it's simply encompass, 
E-N-C-O-M-P-A-S-S, and then CC. That stands for connectioncenter.org. So encompasscc.org. Um, if you want to take a look at what we're doing with regard to education and uh, couples, just add a forward slash rings, R-I-N-G-S, and uh, that'll get you there. And, and so most of us, and I, I don't think we've talked about this, but um, we've made some adjustments where we're not doing rings classes anymore. It's all virtual. So the education is virtual, it's online, but then we do the coaching in between them doing uh, work on, on, uh, on a virtual portal that's getting them the education. That's great. Awesome. That's great. Well, we really appreciate you joining us today. And to folks out there, uh, please connect with Laverne and Rhonda through Encompass uh, Connection Center. We will put in the link, uh, the description below, mm -hmm. their uh, information there. Uh, and also, we do want to encourage the beauty of having their virtual uh, classes and their virtual mm -hmm. teaching is that if you're catching this video um, all around the world, you could be able to access that and connect uh, with them. Absolutely. You don't have to be in their hometown, uh, but you can be able to access that. And uh, Laverne and Rhonda, we're so grateful that you joined us uh, today. And um, if you want more from uh, Teresa and myself, uh, we'll also put that description uh, in the description below our link, as well as for coaching. If you're interested in coaching, we can do that virtually as well via Zoom. So you can get that for all over. You don't have to be regionally connected to us as well. And right. so, and they should do what? They should they hit should the. Do what? They should hit the thumbs up. <laughs> and you should subscribe. <laughs> do it. Do it. That's, that's right. Do it. And we look forward to seeing you all later. Thanks for joining us today.